The Guest by Albert Camus. The schoolmaster was watching the two men climb toward him. One was on horseback, the other on foot. They had not yet tackled the abrupt rise leading to the schoolhouse built on the hillside. They were toiling onward, making slow progress in the snow among the stones on the vast expanse of the high, deserted plateau. From time to time, the horse stumbled. Without hearing anything yet, he could see the breath issuing from the horse's nostrils. One of the men, at least, knew the region. They were following the trail, although it had disappeared days ago under a layer of dirty white snow. The schoolmaster calculated that it would take them half an hour to get onto the hill. It was cold. He went back into the school to get a sweater. He crossed the empty frigid classroom. On the blackboard, the four rivers of France, drawn with four different colored chalks, had been flowing toward their estuaries for the past three days. Snow had suddenly fallen in mid-October after eight months of drought without the transition of rain, and the twenty pupils, more or less, who lived in the villages scattered over the plateau had stopped coming. With fair weather, they would return. Daru now heated only the single room that was lodging adjoining the classroom and giving also onto the plateau to the east. Like the class cows, his windows looked to the south, too. On that side, the school was a few kilometers from the point where the plateau began to rise toward the south. In clear weather, uh, could be seen the purple mass of mountain range where the gap opened onto the desert. Somewhat warm, Daru returned to the window from which he had seen the first seen the two men. They were no longer visible, hence they must have tackled the rise. The sky was not so dark, for the snow had stopped falling during the night. The morning had opened with a dirty light that had scarcely become brighter as the ceiling of clouds lifted. At two in the afternoon, it seemed as if the day were merely beginning, but still, this was better than those three days when the thick snow was falling amidst the unbroken darkness with little gust of wind that rattled the double door of the classroom. Then Daru had spent long hours in his room, leaving it only to go to the shed and feed the chickens or get some coal. Fortunately, the delivery truck from Tajid, the nearest village to the north, had brought his supplies two days before the blizzard. It would return in 48 hours. Besides, he had enough to resist a siege, for the little room was cluttered with bags of wheat that the administration left as a stock to distribute to those of his pupils whose families had suffered from the drought. Actually, they had all been victims because they were all poor. Every day, Daru would distribute ration to the children. They had missed it, he knew, during these bad days. Possibly one of the fathers would come this afternoon, and he could supply them with grain. It was just a matter of carrying them over to the next harvest. Now shiploads of wheat were arriving from France, and the worst was over. But it would be hard to forget that poverty, that army of ragged ghosts wandering in the sunlight, the plateaus burned to a cinder month after month, the earth shriveled up little by little, literally scorched, every stone bursting into dust under one's foot. The sheep had died then by thousands, and even a few men here and there, sometimes without anyone's knowing. In contrast with such poverty, he, who lived most like, almost like a monk in his remote schoolhouse, nonetheless satisfied with the little he had, and with the rough life he had felt like a lord, with his whitewashed walls, his narrow couch, his unpainted shells, his well, and his weekly provision of water and food. And suddenly this snow, without warning, without the foretaste of rain, this was the way the region was, cruel to live in, even without men who didn't help matters either. But Daru had been born here, everywhere else he felt exiled. He stepped out onto the terrace in front of the schoolhouse. The two men were now halfway up the slope. He recognized the horse as Balducci, the old gendarme who he had known for a long time. Balducci was holding one end of the rope, an Arab who was walking behind him with hands bound and head lowered. The gendarme waved a greeting to which Daru did not reply lost as he was in contemplation of the Arab dressed in a faded blue jabala. His feet and sandals but covered with socks of heavy wara wool, his head surmounted by a narrow short chech. They were approaching. Balducci was holding back his horse in order not to hurt the Arab, and the group was advancing slowly. Within earshot, Balducci shouted, One hour to do the three kilometers from El Amur. Daru did not answer. Short and square in his thick sweater, he watched them climb. Not once had the Arab raised his head. Hello, said Daru, when they got up to the terrace. Come in and warm up. 
Alducci watched him uh, painfully got down from his horse without letting go of the rope. From under his bristling mustache, he smiled at the schoolmaster, his little dark eyes deep set under a tanned forehead, and his mouth surrounded with wrinkles made him look attentive and studious. Daru took the bridle, led the horse to the shed, and came back to the two men, who were now waiting for him in the school. He led them into his room. I'm going to heat up the classroom, he said. We'll be more comfortable there. When he entered the room again, Balducci was on the couch. He had undone the rope tying him to the Arab who had squashed near the stove. His hand still bound, the chetch pushed back on his head. He was looking toward the window. At first, Aru noticed only his huge, fat lips, smooth, almost negroid. Yet his nose was straight, his eyes were dark and full of fever. The chetch revealed an obstinate forehead, and under the weathered skin, now rather discolored by the, gold, by the cold, the whole face had a restless and rebellious look that struck Daru when the Arab, turning his face toward him, looked him straight in the eyes. Go into the other room, said the schoolmaster, and I'll make you some mint tea. Thanks, Balducci said. What a chore. How I long for retirement. And addressing his prisoner in Arabic, come on, you. The Arab got up and slowly holding his hands, his bound wrist in front of him, went into the classroom. With the tea, Daru brought a chair, but Balducci was in, already enthroned on the nearest pupil's desk, and the Arab had squatted against the teacher's platform facing the stove, which stood between the desk and the window. When he held out the glass of tea to the prisoner, Daru hesitated at the sight of his bound hands. He might perhaps be untied? Sure, said Balducci. That was for the trip. He started to get to his feet, but Daru, setting the glass on the floor, had knelt, knelt beside the Arab. Without saying anything, the Arab watched him with his feverish eyes. Once his hands were free, he rubbed his swollen wrists against each other, took the glass of tea, and sucked up the burning liquid in swift little sips. Good, said Daru. And where are you headed? Baldici withdrew his mustache from the tea. Here, son. Odd pupils, and you're spending the night? No, I'm going back to Elamur, and you will deliver this fellow, Tintinguit, is expected at police headquarters. Balducci was looking at Daru with a friendly little smile. What's this story? asked schoolmaster. Are you pulling my leg? No, son. Those are the orders. The orders? I'm not. Daru hesitated, not wanting to hurt the old Corsican. I mean, that's not my job. What? What's the meaning of that? In wartime, people do all kinds of jobs. Then I'll wait for the declaration of war. Balducci nodded. Okay, but the orders exist, and they concern you, too. Things are brewing, it appears. There's talk of a forthcoming revolt. We are mobilized in any way. Daru still had his obstinate look. Listen, son, said Balducci. I like you, and you must understand. There's only a dozen of us, of us at El Amor to patrol throughout the whole territory of a small department, and I must get back in a hurry. I was told to hand this guy over to you and return without delay. He couldn't be kept there. His village was beginning to stir. They wanted to take him back. You must take him to Tinguit tomorrow before the day is over. 20 kilometers shouldn't phase a husky fellow like you. After that, all will be over. You'll come back to your pupils and your comfortable life. Behind the wall, the horse could be heard snorting and pawing the earth. Daru was looking out the window. Decidedly, the weather had was clearing and the light was increasing over the snowy plateau. When all the snow had melted, the sun would take over again and once more it would burn the fields of stone. For days still, the unchanging sky would shed its dry light on the solitary expanse where nothing had any connection with man. After all, he said, turning around toward Balducci, what did he do? And before the gendarme had opened his mouth, he asked, does he speak French? No, not a word. We had been looking for him for a month, but they were hiding him. He killed his cousin. Is he against us? I don't think so, but you can never be sure. Why did he kill? Ah, family squabble. I think one owned the other grain, it seems. Owed the other grain. It's not all clear. In short, he killed his cousin with a bill hook. You know, like a sheep. <coughs> Balducci made the gesture of drawing a blade across his throat and the Arab, his attention attracted, watched him with a sort of anxiety. 
Daru felt a sudden wrath against them all, against them all, against all men with their rotten spite, their tireless hates, their blood lust. But the kettle was singing on the stove. He served Balducci more tea, hesitated, then served the Arab again, who a second time drank avidly his raised arms, made the jalaba fall open, and the schoolmaster saw his thin, muscular chest. Thanks, kid, Balducci said. Yeah, now I'm off. He got up and went toward the Arab, taking a small rope from his pocket. What are you doing? Daru asked dryly. Balducci, disconcerted, showed him the rope. Don't bother. The old gendarme hesitated. It's up to you, of course. You are armed. I have my shotgun. Where? In the trunk. You ought to have it near your bed. Why? I have nothing to fear. You're crazy, son. If there's an uprising, no one is safe. We're all in the same boat. I'll defend myself. I'll have time to see them coming. Balducci began to laugh. Then suddenly the mustache covered his white, his white teeth. You'll have time? All right. That's just what I was saying. You have always been a little cracked. That's why I like you, my son. My son was a lot like that, too. At the same time, he took out his revolver and put it on the desk. Keep it. I don't need two weapons from here to Eleanor. The revolver shone against the black paint of the table. When the gendarme turned toward him, the schoolmaster caught the smell of leather and horse flesh. Listen, Balducci, Daru said suddenly. Every bit of this disgusts me. And first of all, your fellow here. But I won't hand him over. Fight? Yes. Uh, if I have to, but not that. The old gendarme stood in front of him and looked at him severely. You're being a fool, he said slowly. I don't like it either. You don't get used to putting a rope on a man, even after years of it. And you're even ashamed, yes, ashamed, but you can't let them have their way. I won't hand him over, Daru said again. It's an order, son, and I repeat it. That's right. Repeat to them what I've said to you. I won't hand him over. Balducci made a visible effort to reflect. He looked at the Arab and at Daru. At last he decided, No, I won't tell them anything. If you want to drop us, go ahead. I'll not denounce you. I have an order to deliver the prisoner, and I'm doing so. And now you'll just sign this paper for me. There's no need. I'll not deny that you left him with me. Don't be mean with me. I know you'll tell the truth. You're from hereabouts, and you are a man. But you must sign. That's the rule. Daru opened his drawer, took out a little square pot bottle of purple ink, the red wooden, wooden pen holder with the sergeant major pen he used for making models of penmanship, and signed. The gendarme carefully folded the paper and put it into his wallet. Then he moved toward the door. I'll see you off, Daru said. No, said Balducci. There's no use being polite. You insulted me. He looked at the air, motionless in the same spot, sniffed peevishly, and turned away toward the door. Goodbye, son, he said. The door shut behind him. Balducci appeared suddenly outside the window and then disappeared. His footsteps were muffled by the snow. The horse stirred on the other side of the wall, and several chickens fluttered in fright. A moment later, Balducci reappeared outside the window, leading the horse by the bridle. He walked toward the little rise without turning around and disappeared from sight with the horse following him. A big stone could be heard bouncing down. Daru walked back toward the prisoner, who, without stirring, never took his eyes off him. Wait, the schoolmaster said in Arabic, and he went toward the bedroom. As he was going through the door, he had a second thought, went to the desk, took the revolver, and stuck it in his pocket. Then, without looking back, he went into his room. For some time, he lay on his couch, watching the sky gradually close over, listening to the silence. It was this silence that had seemed painful to him during the first days here, after the war. He had requested a post in a little town at the base of the foothills, separating him from the upper plateaus from the desert. There, rocky walls, green and black to the north, pink and lavender to the south, marked the frontier of eternal summer. He had been named to a post farther north on the plateau itself. In the beginning, the solitude and silence had been hard for him on these wastelands, peopled only by stones. Occasionally, furrows suggested cultivation, but they had been dug to uncover a certain kind of stone good for building. The only plowing here was to harvest rocks. 
Elsewhere, a thin layer of soil accumulated in the hollows could be scraped out to enrich paltry village gardens. This is the way it was, bare, rock-covered three-quarters of the region. Towns sprang up, flourished, then disappeared. Men came by, loved one another, or fought bitterly, then died. No one in this desert, neither he nor his guest, mattered. And yet outside this desert, neither of them, Daru knew, could have really lived. When he got up, no noise came from the classroom. He was amazed by the unmixed joy he derived from the mere thought that the Arab might have fled, that he would be alone with no decision to make. But the prisoner was there. He had merely stretched out between the stove and the desk. With eyes open, he was staring at the ceiling. In that position, his thick lips were particularly noticeable, giving him a pelting look. Come, said Daru. The Arab got up and followed him. In the bedroom, the schoolmaster pointed to a chair near the table under the window. The Arab sat down without taking his eyes off Daru. Are you hungry? Yes, the prisoner said. Daru set the table for two. He took flour and oil, shaped a cake in a frying pan, and lighted the little stove that functioned on bottled glass. When the cake was cooking, he went out to the shed to get cheese, eggs, dates, and condensed milk. When the cake was done, he set it on the window sill to cool, heated some condensed milk, diluted with water, and beat up the eggs into an omelet. In one of his motions, he knocked against the revolver, stuck his right hand in his right hand pocket. He set down the bowl down, went into the classroom, put the revolver in his desk drawer. When he came back to the room, it was uh, night was falling. He put out the light and served the Arab. Eat, he said. The Arab took a piece of the cake, lifted it eagerly to his mouth, and stopped short. And you? he asked. After you, I'll eat too. Thick lips opened slightly. The Arab hesitated, then bit into the cake determinedly. The meal over, the Arab looked at the schoolmaster. Are you the judge? No, I'm simply keeping you until tomorrow. Why do you eat with me? I'm hungry. The Arab fell silent. Daru got up and went out. He brought back a folding bed from the shed, set it up between the table and the stove, perpendicular to his own bed. From a large suitcase, which upright in the corner served as a shelf for papers, he took two blankets and arranged them on the camp bed. Then he stopped, felt useless, and sat down on his bed. There was nothing more to do or to get ready. He had to look at this man. He looked at him, therefore, trying to imagine his face bursting with rage. He couldn't do so. He could see nothing but the dark yet shining eyes and the animal mouth. Why did you kill him? he asked in a voice whose hostile tone surprised him. The Arab looked away. He ran away. I, I ran after him. He raised his eyes to Daru again, and they were full of sort of woeful interrogation. Now what will they do with me? Are you afraid? He stiffened, turning his eyes away. Are you sorry? The Arab stared at him open mouthed Obviously, he did not understand. Daru's annoyance was growing. At the same time, he felt awkward and self-conscious with his big body wedged between those two beds. Lie down there, he said impatiently. That's your bed. The Arab didn't move. He called to Daru. Tell me, the schoolmaster looked at him. Is the gendarme coming back tomorrow? I don't know. Are you coming with us? I don't know. Why? The prisoner got up and stretched out on the top of the blankets, his feet toward the windows. The light from the electric bulb shone straight into his eyes, and he closed them at once. Why? Daru repeated, standing beside the bed. The Arab opened his eyes under the blinding light and looked at him, trying not to blink. Come with us, he said. In the middle of the night, Daru was still not asleep. He had gone to bed after undressing completely. He generally slept naked, but when he suddenly realized that he had nothing on, he hesitated. He felt vulnerable, and in the temptation came to him to put his clothes back on. Then he shrugged his shoulders. After all, he wasn't a child, and if need be, he could break his adversary in two. From his bed, he could observe him lying on his back, still motionless, with his eyes closed under the harsh light. When Daru turned out the light, the schoolmaster seemed to coagulate all of a sudden. Little by little, the night came back to life in the window where the starless sky was stirring gently. The schoolmaster soon made out the body lying at his feet. 
The Arab still did not move. His eyes seemed open. A light wind was prowling around the schoolhouse. Perhaps it would drive away the clouds and the sun would reappear. The sun would reappear. During the night, the wind increased. The hens fluttered a little and then were silent. The Arab turned over on his side with his back to Daru, who thought he heard him moan. Then he listened for his guest's breathing, become heavier and more regular. He listened to that breath so close to him and mused without being able to go to sleep. In this room where he had been sleeping alone for a year, this presence bothered him. But it bothered him also by imposing on him a sort of brotherhood he knew well but refused to accept in the present circumstances. Men who shared the same room, soldiers or prisoners, develop a strange alliance as if, having cast off their armor with their clothing, they fraternized every evening over and above their differences in the ancient community of dream and fatigue. But Daru shook himself. He didn't like such musings, and it was essential to sleep. A little later, however, when the Arab stirred slightly, the schoolmaster was still not asleep. When the prisoner made a second move, he stiffened on the alert. The Arab was lifting himself slowly on his arms with almost the motion of a sleepwalker. Seated upright in bed, he waited motionless without turning his head toward Daru, as if he were listening attentively. Daru did not stir. It had just occurred to him that the revolver was still in the drawer out of his desk, and it was better to act at once. Yet he continued to observe the prisoner, who, with the same slithery motion, put his feet on the ground, waited again, then began to stand up slowly. Daru was about to call out to him when the Arab began to walk. In a quite natural but extraordinary silent way, he was heading toward the door at the end of the room that opened into the shed. He lifted the latch with precaution and went out, pushing the door behind him, but without shutting it. Daru had not stirred. He's running away, he merely thought. Good riddance. And yet he listened attentively. The hens were not fluttering. The guest must be on the plateau. A faint sound of water reached him, and he didn't know what it was until the Arab again stood framed in the doorway, closed the door carefully, and came back to bed without a sound. Then Daru turned his back on him and fell asleep. Still later, he seemed from the depths of his sleep to hear furtive steps out around the schoolhouse. I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming, he repeated to himself, and he went on sleeping. When he awoke, the sky was clear. The loose window let in a cold, pure air. The Arab was asleep, hunched up under the blankets, his mouth open, utterly relaxed. But when Daru shook him, he suddenly stared dreadfully at Daru with wild eyes, as if he had never seen him, and such a frightened expression that the schoolmaster stepped back. Don't be afraid. It's me. You must eat. The Arab nodded his head and said, yes. Calm had returned to his face, but his expression was vacant and listless. The coffee was ready. They drank it, seated together in the folding bed as they munched their pieces of their cake. Then Daru led the Arab under the shed and showed him the faucet where he washed. He went back into the room, folded the blankets in the bed, made his own bed, and put the room in order. Then he went through the classroom and out onto the terrace. The sun was already rising in the blue sky. A soft, bright light was bathing the deserted plateau. On the ridge, the snow was melting in spots. Little stones were about to reappear. Crouched on the edge of the plateau, the schoolmaster looked at the deserted expanse. He thought of Balducci. He had heard him, for he had sent him off in a way that he didn't want to be associated with him. He could still hear the gendarme's farewell, and without knowing why, he felt strangely empty and vulnerable. At that moment, from the other side of the schoolhouse, the prisoner coughed. Daru listened to him almost despite himself, and then furious threw a pebble that whistled through the air before sinking into the snow. That man's stupid crime revolted him, but to hand him over was contrary to honor. Merely thinking of it made him smart with humiliation, and he cursed at one and the same time his own people who had sent this Arab to him, and the Arab too who had dared to kill and had not managed to get away. Daru got up walked in a circle on the terrace, waited motionless, and then went back into the schoolhouse. The Arab leaned over the cement floor of the shed, his washing, was washing his teeth with two fingers. Daru looked at him and said, come. He went back into the room of the prisoner. He slipped a hunting jacket over, on over his sweater and put on walking shoes. 
Standing, he waded into the Arab, had put on his chech and sandals. They went into the classroom, and the schoolmaster pointed to the exit, saying, Go ahead. The fellow didn't budge. I'm coming, said Daru. The Arab went out. Daru went back into the room and made a package of pieces of rusk, dates, and sugar. In the classroom before going out, he hesitated a second in front of his desk, then crossed the threshold and locked the door. That's the way, he said. He started toward the east, followed by the prisoner. But a short distance from the schoolhouse, he thought he heard a sound behind him. He retraced his steps and examined the surroundings of the house. There was no one there. The Arab watched him without seeming to understand. Come on, said Daru. They walked for an hour and rested beside a sharp peak of limestone. The snow was melting faster and faster, and the sun was drinking up the puddles of, at, at once, rapidly cleaning the plateau, which gradually dried and vibrated like the air itself. When they had resumed walking, the ground rang under their feet. From time to time, a bird rent the space in front of them with a joyful cry. Daru breathed in deeply the fresh morning light. He felt a sort of rapture before the vast, familiar expanse, now almost entirely yellow under its dome of blue sky. They walked an hour more, descending toward the south. They reached a level height made up of crumbly rocks. From there, on the plateau sloped down, eastward toward a low plain where there were a few spindly trees and this, to the south toward outcroppings of rock that gave the landscape a chaotic look. Daru surveyed the two directions. There was nothing but the sky on the horizon. Not a man could be seen. He turned to the Arab, who was looking at him blankly. Daru held out the package to him. Take it, he said. There are dates, bread, and sugar. You can hold out for two days. Here are a thousand franc notes. The Arab took the package and the money, but kept his full hands at chest level, as if he didn't know what to do with what was being given him. Now look, the schoolmaster said, as he pointed in the direction of the east. There's the way to Tinguit. You have a two-hour walk. At Tinguit, you'll find the administration and the police. They are expecting you. The Arab looked toward the east, then holding the package and the money against his chest. Daru took his elbow and turned him rather roughly toward the south. At the foot of the height on which they stood could be seen a faint path. That's the trail across the plateau. In a day's walk from here, you'll find a pasture land with the first nomads. They'll take you in and shelter you according to their law. The Arab now turned toward Daru, and a sort of panic was visible in his expression. Listen, he said. Daru shook his head. No, be quiet. Now, I'm leaving you. He turned his back on, on him, took two long steps in the direction of the school, looked hesitatingly at the motionless Arab, and started off again. For a few minutes, he heard nothing but his own steps resounding on the cold ground and did not turn his head. A moment later, however, he turned around. The Arab was still there on the edge of the hill, his arms hanging now. He was looking at the schoolmaster. Daru felt something rise in his throat, but he swore with impatience, waved vaguely, and started off again. He had already gone some distance when he again stopped and looked. There was no longer anyone on the hill. Daru hesitated. The sun was now rather high in the sky and was beginning to beat down on his head. The schoolmaster retraced his steps at first somewhat uncertainly and then with decision. When he reached the little hill, he was bathed in sweat. He climbed it as fast as he could and stopped. Out of breath at the top, the rock fields fled to the south, stood out sharply against the blue sky. But on the plain to the east, a steamy heat was already rising. And in that slight haze, Daru, with heavy heart, made out the Arab walking slowly on the road to prison. A little later, standing before the window of the classroom, the schoolmaster was watching the clear light bathing the whole surface of the plateau, but he hardly saw it. Behind him, on the blackboard, among the winding French rivers, sprawled the clumsily chalked up words he had just read. You handed over our brother. You will pay for this. Daru looked at the sky, the plateau, and beyond the invisible land stretching all the way to the sea. In this vast landscape he had loved so much, he was alone.